Welcome to the History of Retina's Leaders and Legends series. The purpose of these interviews is to capture firsthand stories from individuals with unique retinal insights of historical significance. Through these discussions, we hope to provide a fuller understanding of the evolution of both the science and practice of retina through the lens of those individuals who have actually lived it. It is my distinct pleasure to be joined today by a true giant in the field of ophthalmology and retina, Morton F. Goldberg. Dr. Goldberg is Director Emeritus of the Wilmer Eye Institute and is a preeminent researcher, scientist, educator, and clinician. He graduated from Harvard College and Harvard Medical School and was Chief Resident at Yale New Haven Hospital and then at the Wilmer Eye Institute at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. He rose through the leadership ranks with remarkable speed. In 1967, after completing residency, he was appointed assistant clinical professor of ophthalmology at Yale while serving two years in the US Public Health Service. Just three years later, he became professor and head of ophthalmology at the University of Illinois College of Medicine and ophthalmologist-in-chief at the University of Illinois Hospital and Eye and Ear Infirmary. He returned to Johns Hopkins in 1989 as the William Holland Wilmer Professor of Ophthalmology and Director of the Wilmer Ophthalmologic Institute, a role he held until being named Professor and Director Emeritus in 2003. Dr. Goldberg has written over 600 scientific publications and 10 books on his research and clinical experience. It's no surprise that he has received the field's most prestigious awards, too many to list here. He is a firm believer in the ripple effect, and it's clear that his considerable influence on the field and lives of patients continues to be felt thanks to the generation of fellows and residents he has trained through the years. So Dr. Goldberg, it's really a pleasure to have you join us for the history of retina. So I wanna go right back to the beginning for you and talk a little bit about what got you into medicine before we got you into ophthalmology. I grew up in a medical family. My father was a general practitioner in northeastern Massachusetts on the New Hampshire border, semi-rural area. And um, he had his medical office in our house and he uh, took office calls every afternoon. The fee was $2 per visit. And then later in the afternoon, and sometimes late at night, he would make house calls. And I would go with him on the house calls, and the fee for the house call was 50% higher than the office call. It was $3, $3, but that was a lot for those people, and they often bartered, they had a barter economy, and the, the lobster man would give my father a lobster too, the fishermen some flounders, the farmers a bushel of potatoes, that sort of thing. And uh, it, it was not a lucrative practice, but I thought that the life of, of a doctor was really very, very rewarding and gratifying. And being able to make people feel better was a, a very, very worthwhile way to spend one's life. I never thought of uh, doing anything else. And um, so I was a pre-med student and then took a general uh, medical internship after medical school and uh, could have gone in a hundred different ways at that point. So Dr. Goldberg, tell me how you developed the interest in ophthalmology that's going to drive the entirety of the rest of your life. I loved uh, endocrinology. I love pathology, and I, I took a little elective with the chairman of the Harvard Pathology Department, a very distinguished man named Arthur Herdig, and he was doing brilliant work, and I said, I, I, I want to be just like you. This is a recurrent theme in my life. Every preceptor or mentor I had, I admired so much that I, I honestly wanted to be just like them. 
But Dr. Herdig said, if you want to be a pathologist, you should go down to the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. What? Yes, there's a man named Dr. David Kogan there who is a better pathologist than I am, said Dr. Herdig. Well, it was the Eisenhower era when young men did what they were told. And I said, yes, sir. So I went down there and I thought Dr. Kogan was the most brilliant and humble man I had ever met in my entire life. And I did want to be just like him. So I said, I want to stay here and be a resident and I want to be just like you. He said, well, no, there's a better place. You should go down to Baltimore to the Wilmer Institute and Dr. Mormony, Dr. Edward Mormony will be the chairman there, is the chairman there. And he, he picked up the phone right then and there and called him. They were old friends. And he said, Ed, uh, I've got a boy here and you should take him for the residency. And, and without batting an eyelash, as far as I could tell, Dr. Mahoney said, okay, just like that. And so I went to Baltimore and walked through the cool high ceiling corridors where the photographic portraits of all the former residents were. Many of them were famous, I had learned in the, in the interim. And I said, wow, this is just a fabulous place. The full-time faculty consisted of three people, but they were exceptionally intelligent, particularly Dr. Edward Mormony, who at the time, and now in retrospect, uh, Tim, I believe he was the most innovative, most productive, most ingenious, best technical surgeon of the entire 20th century. He was a polymath. He knew everything. He could do everything with charm and skill and finesse. And I wanted to be just like him. So um, I decided then and there, residency was for me, a career in ophthalmology was definitely for me. I finished residency, finished fellowship, then went into the uh, public health service. And that public health experience turned out to be a gift in its way also. It was a big gift. I was stationed in the Washington area and um, I would make regular rounds at the Walter Reed Army Hospital and the Bethesda Naval Hospital where Dr. Mormony and the chief of retina, Dr. Bob Welch, would visit monthly to give grand rounds and they were electric. They were terrific at Wilmer when I was in training and with the, those two people leading them at the military hospitals, it was a great education. By sheer chance, by serendipity, a young medical student graduate, recent graduate from the University of Maryland School of Medicine named Stuart Fine, who later became a famous, justifiably famous retinal specialist and eventually chairman of ophthalmology at the Shea Institute in Philadelphia. Stuart was assigned to my office sheerly by chance. He had never had ophthalmology. He hadn't had his residency in anything. And he was thinking, well, maybe I'll be a neurosurgeon or a urologist or something. But he saw how exciting the rounds could be, what, what great teaching those people were engaged in. And he, he saw how excited I was by it, and he decided to apply for an, an eye residency himself. So that was one good thing about the service. Another very valuable thing was traveling through India to look at eye hospitals. I traveled for six weeks by myself from top to bottom, from the Punjab to the southern tip of the continent, from Calcutta in, in the east, to Bombay, now Mumbai in the west. I traveled by every which way. But finally, near the end of the six-week trip, I ended up in the south of India in the city of Madurai, where I met a Dr. Venkataswamy who was running a, a small eye service in a government hospital and who later founded the now famous Aravind Eye Hospital System. Dr. Venkataswamy was as saintly a person as I've ever personally met. He was totally selfless. All he cared about was taking excellent care of as many patients as he could. He was a remarkable surgeon. He had psoriatic arthritis. His fingers were bent at right angles to each other. And yet he could hold a grafy knife in the web space of his thumb and forefinger and make a 180 degree corneal section and do an intracap and then put in one 4-0 black silk suture. That was the operation. My wife was with me on a subsequent trip. She timed Dr. Venkata Swami doing a cataract operation that I've just described. I'm not joking. 
but she timed him to speculum in, to speculum out. It was 90 seconds, hmm. 90 seconds. And all of his students could do the same thing. At the time, Dr. Venkataswamy had a staff of three, his sister and brother-in-law and one other person. The four of them founded the Arab and Eye Hospital. Today, the Arab and Hospital, Eye Hospital is, I think, the largest eye hospital in the world. And we were able to set up the exchange program that now still exists for uh, Wilmer Institute, Mass Eye and Ear, several other American hospitals who send residents over there to learn how to do good, efficient, quick cataract operations. And in return, I took, when I was still at Illinois as chairman, I took their trained residents to teach them how to do specialty surgery photocoagulation, retinal detachments, vitrectomies, uh, and so on. Those exchange programs are still going strong half a century later. So being in the public health service was indeed a highly productive event. But one of the good things is I traveled and got to know uh, Stuart Fine. We became the best of friends and remain the best of friends. And uh, we would go subsequently, when Stuart finally made up his mind to take an eye residency, we would travel to eye meetings like the Academy meeting and the Arvo and, and so on. So in the public health service, you had some unique time opportunities also, and, and you and Dr. Fine were able to explore some collaborative efforts that really changed our field in a big way. Oh, well, thank you. I, I like to think so. Um, I think you're referring to the Early House Symposium for the Treatment of Diabetic Retinopathy, which was held in 1968. Uh, it started in the following fashion. Stuart Fine just asked a naive, honest question of me once, after being at rounds with either Bethesda or Walter Reed, and he said, uh, what's the best treatment for diabetic retinopathy? Well, it shocked me to my bone marrow because I realized I didn't know. And so Stuart and I decided to call a meeting of the world's experts in diabetic retinopathy. Not that any, any of them really knew what was going on, but they, they were the acknowledged experts and wrote about it. We invited 50 people from around the world, United States, Canada, Sweden, Norway, England, France, Germany. They were all gifted people. And they came to this rural a conference center called the Early House, about an hour's ride from Washington, too far for them to go every evening and get back, too, so they had to hang around for a three-day weekend and talk to each other. It was a wonderful conference. We published a book, 900 pages long, and it talked about photocoagulation, metabolic control, and pituitary ablation. In that book, that 900-page book, the Early House Symposium, there are actually 20 chapters on pituitary ablation. Well, Stuart and I weren't neurosurgeons. We, we had to believe there was something better. Good metabolic control was then and still is a very good way to take care of diabetic patients with retinopathy or any diabetic patient. Um, photocoagulation was in its infancy. One of the last papers given was by a colleague of Dr. William Beetham from the Joslin Clinic in Boston. His son and grandson, the famous ophthalmologist, Lloyd Aiello and, and Lloyd Aiello. And the youngest, Lloyd Aiello, was a resident of mine and, and a brilliant guy. And they saw their father-in-law and grandfather doing pan-retinal photocoagulation with a ruby laser. The argon laser hadn't been invented yet. The ruby laser was a pretty good laser. It had a lousy um, viewing system, it was a direct, monocular direct ophthalmoscope, very hard to use. But they were convinced that it was getting good results. At the Ailey House Symposium, some people said, well, this is a better technique than panhypopituitarism. Uh, and the, the neurosurgeons disagreed. They said, you cannot treat the macula with a laser. And it was true that no one was treating the macula. No one thought much about the macula. They were just interested in, in disc neovascularization and peripheral clinically significant NVE. So there was controversy at, at the symposium, but at least 
the idea of uh, panretinal photocoagulation was entertained for the first time and recommended to have a first ever prospective randomized collaborative clinical trial. It was the first in all of ophthalmology and virtually all of medicine. That was one of the good things that came out of the Haley House Symposium. It was putting panhypopituitarism under the microscope to scrutinize the data and not necessarily believe the technically excellent neurosurgeons. Uh, the other things that happened was that the people agreed on a standard nomenclature. Previously, they couldn't talk about diabetic retinopathy together. And the other thing that happened was that a classification system of diabetic retinopathy was, was promulgated and still largely used in modified form today. And uh, in addition, um, photocoagulation was examined much more thoroughly. So there were several good things that came out of the Early House Symposium, and the last of which I'll mention is the standard seven photographic fields of 30 degrees each. So it was proven by the DRS that the risk of, of severe diabetic retinopathy, what was called clinically significant diabetic retinopathy, could be markedly ameliorated by photocoagulation. And by then, the laser, argon laser was available. It turned out to be much better than xenon arc because it was more gentle. It didn't cause as much peripheral field loss. And, and so uh, the, the Ellie House Symposium put treatment of diabetic retinopathy on the map, sponsored, advocated for a randomized clinical trial. The original DRS, the Diabetic Retinopathy Study, reduced the rate of severe visual loss by 50%. Well, I don't know too many treatments that improve anything by 50%. So what then happened was good results were obtained with PRP, scatter random spray, uh, but, but the vision didn't go to 2020 all the time. The, the peripheral retina looked much better. The flat neovascularization went away for the most part. But visual acuity was still only 2040 to 2050. And better, it was not 2200 or 2400. And for the first time ever, people began to think, well, maybe it's the macula. And so as an offshoot of the DRS, the early treatment diabetic retinopathy study was initiated to determine just how important is the macula. No one was treating diabetic macular edema. It was called background retinopathy, a pre-proliferative retinopathy. No one thought the macula could be that important. Um, now, of course, one thinks about center-involved macular uh, degeneration in diabetic retinopathy, but it was an unknown entity at the time until the early treatment diabetic retinopathy study showed that focal treatment even in the macula or around the macula, could improve visual acuity, contrary to the neurosurgeons who said lasers cannot be used in the macula or around the macula. So um, all of this stemmed from Stuart's and my two years of national duty by serving in the public uh, health service. And then and now, to this minute, that remains a very gratifying experience. Talk to me a little bit about how panretinal photocoagulation went with the community at large, because so much of what we do in, in that initial reporting differs from what people believe. When I started doing it, uh, I did as a resident a lot at Wilmer. That's a very protected environment, and it was tolerated by the local uh, community of private doctors. When I moved to Illinois, I started doing it. I, 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 was, I had the first laser in the Midwest and was using the Argon laser willy-nilly and believing in uh, panretinal photocoagulation. But until the results of the DRS became publicized, uh, practitioners, including retinal specialists, didn't believe in random spray scatter PRP because, Dr. Goldberg, you are destroying permanently the most precious tissue in the human body, the retina. That's not only unethical, it's illegal. So I got a lot of that actually, but I was seeing pretty good results and, and so kept doing it. And then eventually the results from the DRS were, were promulgated. 50% improvement, that, that, that put the naysayers uh, uh, down and 
PRP became very widespread. So Dr. Goldberg, one of the things that fascinates me is how you were able very early in your training to, to ask some very unique questions, but then to explore them. And what I love is that you, you kept that um, through, as a focus through your entire career, but you always shared that by publishing. So, so can you tell me how important the concept of, of that clinical research leading to sharing that research through publication was to you? Sure. Uh, it's an important question, one close to my heart, because I, I strongly believe in the value of publication. And I believe in the value of the written word. And um, my first medical uh, publication was as a, an intern at the Peter Ben Brigham in Boston. And I wrote a letter to the editor. I had the temerity to write a letter to the great David Kogan, who was then editor about the danger and the potential side effects of intravenous mannitol, which was then a new treatment to decompress the eye. And Dr. Cohen accepted it. Well, that was wonderful. Just loved the gratification of a, of a chief editor accepting my papers. I didn't like it when they rejected them, but there have been a lot of important rejections in, in the, the life of uh, modern ophthalmology. The paper on fluorescein angiography was first rejected by the American Journal of Ophthalmology. And I've had my share of rejections, but I've always modified them and eventually got them published. I think we touch a lot of lives when we take care of our patients, when we train our residents and fellows. But when we write something, that reach is so great. Every author of a published article is retrievable forever on a computer somewhere in the world. If you're thinking about your legacy, that is a very comforting thought, to be retrievable after you've given up the ghost. And I actually believe that. So take me from Chicago, and how do we get you back into Baltimore? I, I was a loyal alumnus, and I, I loved the Wilmer Institute. I loved my Chicago job. I, I was the first full-time faculty member in the history of the University of Illinois. I had an almost brand new, beautiful new building to populate. And I had the remarkable responsibility to appoint 100% of the faculty, 100% of the faculty, and 100% of the clinical technicians. We went from one full-time faculty member, me, to about 35, and an annual budget of about $350,000 total, to about $7 million and a big booming uh, fundraising office, a development office where none had existed. And we were going strong. We, we were the biggest, and I think at the time, the best program in the Midwest. And I was loving it. And, and everybody had been appointed by me. It's very easy to get things done under those circumstances. But Hopkins was Hopkins, and Wilmer was Wilmer. And I was asked to look at the job uh, when Dr. Edward Maume retired, and uh, I didn't get the job then. I was one of the people who was rejected, but I still loved the place. And 10 years later, the job became available again with the retirement of Dr. Arnold Patz. And eventually, the search committee took a chance with me. I was about 50 at the time. I, would um, Yeah, about 50, 52, I guess. I had been 32 when I became chairman at Illinois. I think I was the youngest chairman in the country at the time. But it's hard to say no to Johns Hopkins and the Wilmer Institute. And I had wonderful feelings for it. And, and so I accepted that job and um, with some misgivings moved back uh, to Baltimore. Tell me how that goes. How, how different is that for you? How do you make Well, the day changes? and night. I thought it would be an easy transition. I knew the culture of the institution. I loved the culture of the institution. But um, there were two factors that made it very, very um, challenging to use a euphemism. By the time I got there, within the first year, three of the heavy hitters left and put the department into an annual deficit of uh, a little over $3 million. Well, that was really a bitter pill to swallow. And um, 
You don't make friends and influence people. People are not going to love you if you take money away from them or you put them on an austerity budget, which is what I felt I had to do to balance the budget. We're going on a no travel uh, status. No one can go to meetings. And if you have extra personnel, you're going to have to get rid of some of them. And to prove that I was serious about it, I gave up, pu very publicly gave up one of my secretaries. I was just trying to prove the point that everyone was in it. I was suffering like everyone else. And the only thing that saved me, Tim, was they knew I was an alumnus and a loyal alumnus. And I never would do anything to harm the Wilmer Institute. I loved it too much and I loved its traditions and its culture, but I had to balance the budget. Anyway, within a short time, within a year, we were in the black and travel could begin, recruitment could begin again, you could use FedEx again. And uh, from there on, it was uh, pretty easy sailing. Well, that's a pretty remarkable story. I think a lot of times we forget the fiduciary issues that that, that the chairman is responsible for as he guides a, a department. So that that must have been a difficult year. It was, I said, challenging before. That, that, that is a euphemism. It was horrendous. Then now you're there, the budget, you have a little bit of latitude. Take me through what your vision is as you move forward at, at Wilmer. I enlarged the fundraising office, the development office. Dr. Patz had copied, he had copied what I had done at Illinois for fundraising, but it wasn't enough. And uh, we built the uh, fundraising office up and we were able to raise enough money to increase the number of full-time endowed full professors to a, a pretty high level. Now, with the uh, continued efforts of my successor, Peter McDonald, who has done a good job raising money for the institution, there are over 50 full-time, fully endowed professors of ophthalmology. That's an extraordinary number. I, I don't know any department in the world that has that number of fully endowed professors. There have been so many big changes too in the way that ophthalmology has, has looked over these decades. Um, we're seeing this evolution to half the class are, are women at a time when you started when there were virtually no women. And we're seeing that, that, that persons of color are now- Not, having... not just virtually, Tim, yeah. absolutely no absolutely. women. Well, so, so tell me, how, how, do you, how do you adapt to that? How were you able to, to bring that into the, the program? The culture changed in the country, a demography changed. This year, our matched residency applicants are 100% women. Same thing was true a few years ago. And they've been at the top of their medical school classes. We weren't, you know, lowering standards. Believe me, we were not. We are raising them in many cases. And the, the, the first couple of female chief residents were so darn good. Julia Haller, who's now the chairperson at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia, Sharon Fekrad, who's a professor at Duke, those, those first few women chief residents set the pace and showed everybody just how good women would be. And we've not been disappointed. One of the things that I, I think that, that defines you is you continue to give back. So that I love the passion and the enthusiasm and, and this belief that you still, you still give back to the, the field, your patients. How do you keep doing that? I remain really super curious about the diseased human eye, and I still read eight or nine journals every month, including yours, which is excellent. And I keep learning, so I, I want to remain a student as best I can be. And um, I also want to remain uh, a teacher to the best I can be, because it satisfies my need for uh, complete knowledge as best as I can make it. Uh, I want to engage in the ripple effect as often as I can. And I'm still having an awful lot of fun at my advanced stage of career evolution. It's a remarkable journey. You're, you're not even close to the end, obviously. So um, thank you for talking with us today. It's been a really, 
really pleasurable experience and, and you've talked about so many things that I think none of us have really heard before. So thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Well, Tim, you're a great interlocutor. Thank you very much.